Hello, and welcome to the one and only edition of Early America and Beer. I'm the host, True to Bill. This is my friend, Gavin. And today, we'll be discussing Early America and its connection with beer. Um, as a way into this conversation, I have a document um, that concerns... Uh, it's an act to prohibit for a limited time the making of whiskey and other spirits from wheat, rye, or any other form of grain or from any meal or flour. Um, it was written by John Bayard of Philadelphia and in the year 1778. So, it's a while back. It's a while back. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, man. Cold one with the boys. All right, so Gavin. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna throw some things out to you. Mm -hmm. So, would you believe that Americans drink an average of 22 gallons of beer a year? A year? According to the historian Middleman. That's a lot of beer. That's a lot of beer. It's like a lot of beer. How much would that be for you? Probably more like, than. Is that? A, do you think that's where you're at, or? I drink a lot more whiskey than I do beer, to be honest with you. But that's. And then taxes on beer have at times provided over 50% of this country's internal revenue, and the industry today has a gross national product of 144 billion, some 84 million Americans drink beer. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, you look how many bars there are around and liquor stores. Yeah, and it funds a lot of yeah. shit in government. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Um, so anyways, in early America, um, the early settlers kind of depended on beer for a safe drinking source that um, makes sense that that's like uh you know with wine too they used to like use wine as a way of though, yeah. Rome, the romans used to do that so that makes sense yeah and so like um brewing beer of course guaranteed a clean drinking supply um vastly more pure than you know um the drinking. historian smith described how they thought of the rivers in europe as like just running sewers basically so mm. they were not seen as like a, a thing to drink from um, and for the most part people drank at home um, and in public um, at any sort of event uh, funerals were no exception um, so you know cheers to grandpa and um, although society frowned on excessive drinking the concept of alcoholism um, either as a disease or an addiction did not exist yet mm, that makes sense so, yeah so, so when there's no stigma against it, I suppose, people just... They, they just went at it, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's probably how they got up to 22 gallons a year. Well, that's now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's probably even higher than that. Yeah, well, probably. Um, so, like, even most, you know, it's it was such a vital component of, like, American culture um, back then that most early kitchens were created around the ability to brew beer. Um, you know, in addition to cooking and food preparation. Um, really? Yeah, and I have a quote here from these that, you know, these ambassadors for the New World to, like, get people to come live in the colony. And right. this guy basically said, um, you know, he was touting the colony as the best on earth. Oh, the water for the colony as the best on earth. But nonetheless, he conceded, yet I dare not prefer it before a good beer. So even Wise while man. even while promoting the colony, he had to make sure to like you know highlight the beer. Um, it's got his priorities, right? Yeah. So the culture around brewing and beer back then started to become um, started to become a gendered thing, um, and it was starting to seem more as women's work to brew beer, especially since you know as I said, kitchens were more created around brewing beer. Um, so men started to actually will. Um, their brewing kettles and equipment to their wives and daughters upon their passing. Um, like I said, baking, cooking, brewing beer were all kind of women's work back yeah. then. Um, and some daughters upon you know their christen christening into womanhood were given um, brewing supplies. Mm. Um, so that was that. Um, and so this is kind of an interesting turn because um, at the start, the the main brewers of beer at the earliest breweries were women until they were kicked out by men when they started making um, bre brewing guilds. Um, mm. So, is that because they made it more of like a trade, like a 
start yeah. a, a career. Yeah, for some reason, I guess, they just did not allow that for women to do that, so. Mm. So, um, as an economy, um, it started to switch from agriculture to commercial. Um, people no longer drank primarily at home, um, and public drinking became an issue. Um, drinking had been a family activity with both men and women participating. Um, as the home became more exclusively women's domain, again, you know, that's when um, this act of like willing brewing equipment to them started to happen and it being thought of as women, women's work. Um, and uh, as it became exclusively women's domain, drinking became a male pursuit, um, according to the historian Middleman. And this leads to the first temperance movement. Huh. Um, so, Traditionally, um, alcohol was thought of as a good creature provided by God for mankind, mankind's benefit. Um, this later changed to the great destroyer and a serpent, according to the historian Rohrer. Um, the, early, the most early, early temp temperance movement uh, originated during the 1810s in the eastern towns of New England and New York, where property federalists sought to reduce crime and pauperism by restraining the drinking habits of the lower classes. So like, you know, that kind of seems like modern day where it's like, we're going to blame it on you know, the, the lower, lower classes. Class, yeah. and like, it's it's kind of funny, so that they would target the lower class yeah, specifically and exactly. not, you know, not like a, just a general ban. And it kind of goes beyond that. Um, these first leaders of temperance naively believed that the lower classes would follow their example um, from restraining themselves to, you know, and they weren't like complete, like, alcohol is done, like, don't drink alcohol at all, they were more so concerned of moderate drinking, because they thought the lower classes drank more drink than they too much. To. Yeah. Um, and of course, this, like, did not work at all. Right. They totally disregarded them. Um, and so, conversely, the next kind of temperance movement was based in um, the evangelical reformers, and they more emphasized self-reform and the necessity of protecting the family more than social control. Mm -hmm. um, so they believed essentially that the United States was bound by a covenant with God. Um, they demonstrated far more concern for the preservation of the covenant, um, the salvation of their families, and the spread of God's kingdom than for the reformation of the depressed classes. <laughs> so it was like sounds a little like more selfish, but more, um, you know, Kind of sounds like my ex-girlfriend's family. Yeah, so kind of like that. Um, <laughs> and that was according to the historian Rohrer again. Um, and so kind of, there was a lot of backlash to this one as well. Um, and again, there's kind of modern reverberations of this, of um, this lowly farmer is quoted as saying, um, some of the best and most intelligent men in America habitually drank ardent spirits without ill effects. Um, which I kind of think of like, you know, in high school, like if someone was talking, you know, shit about like marijuana or something and everyone had that like one guy that was like, you know, yeah, like, you know, super against He was the valedictorian yeah, yeah. or something, but, but no, but he was actually like doing a lot but of, he, yeah. but he was like still smart, you know? Yeah. So I think that, I see that connection. Um, and then. Like a Seth Rogen of sorts. Yeah, a Seth Rogen of sorts. Um, and so this is also the time where um, how they, you know, they didn't really do social control, but um, to target excessive drinking, they started to um, go after unlicensed home breweries because there's kind of a difference between a regular brewery, which is like licensed and you serve um, liquor and food, and then there are these unlicensed home breweries called ordinaries. Um, and these were the ones that, once this temperance movement really, really started going, that they cracked down on these and um, got rid of them actually, after public drunkenness and the accidents. Um, so is like a ordinary kind of like you just drink in someone's home? Kind of, yeah. Yeah. So like what we're doing. Kind what of. we're doing right now, except okay. I, I'd probably charge you, which yeah. I didn't because I'm a good friend. Oh, that's a nice thing. So, um, yeah. Um, and I would just like to talk about the tavern experience in general, particularly in Philadelphia at that time. Um, the public judged the inner workings of a man through his outward experience, mm -hmm. um, which like 
you know, that kind of presents a huge problem if, you know, you're doing that outward appearance in a bar, in a tavern, drinking a lot of liquor, so, mm -hmm. you know, what's going to be shown there? Um, early America, especially in Philadelphia, was a society in which men of different social and political backgrounds rubbed shoulders and talked politics in taverns, so you could have the most lowly men and the most high-class men, um, particularly in the Philadelphia colony, rubbing shoulders in these taverns and talking about politics, basically, which, like, that's kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. That that was like the place where all this like kind of political talk and all these kind of power moves mm -hmm. down. Um, and so like people could directly talk with their um, politicians and give criticisms and while well, drunk. So that's probably good. Um, and yeah, you so probably don't hold back when you're drunk. Yeah, right? exactly. Uh, yeah. So and a lot of times politicians took advantage of this. Um, voters were often wooed and enticed by political candidates through liquor, which would be passed out to them by the candidates themselves, um, according to the historian Thompson. Um, so yeah, I just think that's that's just such a strange thing to think like, you know, yeah. hey, get drunk, vote for me though, you know? It's um, like a town hall, but like at a brewery. Yeah, it's like a brewery Which is hall. honestly the town <laughs> hall I'd go to. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. you're going to make it work. Um, but... At the beginning of the revolution, um, the social attitude started to change. Um, men wanted to attend taverns with others of similar back social background, um, and they started to reject the mixing of sorts. Um, and one of the most popular um, Philadelphia spots for um, this was the City Tavern. Um, George Washington attended this. Um, John Adams attended this. A lot of um, forefathers. Um, and the tavern, at the tavern discourse at this time changed, because um, if someone was against the revolution and American independence from Britain, they were banned from taverns that believed that. Um, but there was Conversely, also this happened on the other side of the ideological spectrum of um, people who were with Britain and wanted America to stay with Britain um, started to claim taverns as their own. Um, so there, there started to be this like war between taverns of, you know, if you believed in American independence, you go to that tavern, and if you are with Britain, you go to that tavern. Huh. Um, so that's kind of, you know. That's kind of neat. It's it, like, it also shows just how important the taverns were that they're like going yeah. out of their way. It's like if nowadays we had like a Democrat versus like a Republican yeah, tavern, like a tavern or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, like a or bar like, in Wisconsin yeah. versus a bar in New York. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and then also just to like highlight again that like you know, America's forefathers were um, into the tavern going. Um, Adams and his fellow patriots often planned um, their activities at taverns, such as the Green Dragon. He and John Hancock met frequently at the Black Horse Tavern in Winchester. Um, Adams, Hancock, and other patriots organized the Sons of Liberty and planned the Boston Tea Party at various taverns. Um, According to the story in the middleman, so like, so basically, just, you got to plan things at taverns. Yeah, that, that so was like it was like the hub of thinking of, of through planning. Yeah, yeah. the plan for. I suppose you got the creative lubricant right here, and yeah. he gets all the creative juices flowing. Exactly. Uh, I just like to think that like, because I always love the Boston Tea Party, just like right. dumping and all that stuff. And it's like they were probably just like drunk. Like, you, think you know so? what? Well, I don't know. You, you know? think so? They, you think they got hammered and they were just like, you know what? Let's go dump some. I, I'm sure like Hancock or Adams or someone was just sitting there, a little drunk. Everyone else is talking, he's like, and then he just comes into the conversation. He's like, let's just dump a boatload of tea and he's like, in the did. water, and they're all like, fuck yeah, and they and they just went with it. You know, they 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 agreed with that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and then just to bring it back around to um, document that kind of started this conversation. Um. Once the revolution was underway, the Continental Congress um, legislated that soldiers receive a beer ration of one quart a day, according to the historian. One Milton. quart? How much is a quart? But well, I guess it's like a fourth of a gallon. Yeah. So let's just go. With that. About I don't that. know. I don't know. No, it is. Yeah. Is it? It is. Okay. I remember that from facts class, the home home ec class. Ah, there we go. Yeah. High school is worth something. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, so and that's basically what the beginning document was why they started to ban um, 
you know, using grain for that thing was because they were using grain for the military. So private yeah. use was banned. Right. Um, so kind of weird though, like they wanted, you know, beer was that essential that they included it in rationing in for rationing, military. Yeah. But I mean, then again, so were cigarettes, right? They were part of rationing. Yeah, they, they probably had tobacco. Yeah, they probably, I mean, they definitely did. Right? But I feel like, you know, tobacco, like what? I mean, that was one of the biggest, uh, you know, agricultural products, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But it's like, you know, are there like drunk revolutionary soldiers just out in the field, you know? Probably would suck with their aim. Can you get know? drunk off a court? Off a court? Yeah. I can't. I don't know. Maybe a lightweight. Maybe. Maybe. Okay, well. Yeah. Um, but. And then finally, um, just a quick little story of um, Sorry, time. when yeah, when they were talking about how you know public excess of drinking started to become a big deal. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the stories I found was um, when the local militia finished one of its monthly drills in Ipswich in 1672. So this is a little before um, the American um, Revolution. Um, the men proceeded, guns and all, to the quarter to Quartermaster Perkins' ordinary. For an early afternoon repast, after several rounds, a couple of rowdy soldiers started to discharge their weapons, according to the historian McWilliams. And one person was actually hit. Um, it started like a riot of people just fighting each other. Dang. Um, so you can kind of see how you know these problems started to bubble up in society with excess drinking and how that could lead to a temperance movement and several others. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, I think we're going to cut to um, our expert answering some questions, uh, but for now, uh, cheers. Cheers. In this time period, People couldn't just drink water. There was a lot of uh, sort of disease in water. So in order to avoid cholera, you could make small beer, which would have a small amount of alcohol content in it, enough to kill the bacteria, and then you could drink it to be hydrated without getting drunk. So small beer was really important in order to keep a group of people, say a group of soldiers, hydrated when they were out in the woods uh, you know, patrolling a frontier. I'm Thomas Landon. I'm the assistant director for Manuscripts, Archives, and Rare Books at the New York Public Library. And today we're looking at George Washington's recipe for beer in his journal from 1757. And by taking a closer look, we might learn that it wasn't as delicious as we think. We call it the, the notebook of a Virginia colonel because it was maintained by Washington as he was captain of the Virginia regiment. This document is important because it shows the personality of George Washington, which then becomes the personality of the United States of America. Washington's notebook includes a lot of things crossed out. He did that in order to prove they were done. Uh, this helps build the myth about the type of person George Washington was. He was exacting, uh, deliberate, uh, and wanted to succeed. So when you actually look at their journal, you, you'll, you'll sort of see why the recipe for beer is separated from his, his sort of goings-on as a Virginia colonel. Washington is known as a, a real draconian. He lashed people for deserting. We know of at least two times where he hung people for desertion. The beer recipe appears at the end of the journal and also upside down which suggests that it was added later because it's on page one of the journal on its reverse side. In this time period, there's not as much stigma around drinking. Everyone drinks. Uh, children drink, women drink. You drink to survive, and you drink beer because it's clean. So the drinking of beer was a sort of everyday occurrence that all people did in order to be hydrated. The beer recipe also is um, unappetizing. Take a large siffer full of bran hops to your taste. Now, there's lots of types of hops. Bran ones don't sound most, most appetizing. Boil these three hours, then strain out 30 gallons into a cooler. Put in three gallons of molasses. Okay, so now you've boiled bran hops. You're adding molasses. So you have a kind of syrupy elixir. 
Then, while the beer is scalding hot, draw the molasses into a cooler. Let this stand until it is little more than blood warm. Then put in a quart of yeast. If the weather is very cold, cover it with a blanket and let it work in the cooler 24 hours. Then put into a cask, leaving the bung open until it is almost done working. Bottle it that day uh, as it was brewed. So you're, bought, you're not aging it. Today's beer makers would never make this beer. Even the, the most sort of dedicated craft brewer would call this beer sort of like <laughs> water. <laughs> Sorry. <That's good. laughs> There's been a lot of focus on the beer recipe, and the reason why it might be because the military history of the French and Indian Wars is not as exciting as the, the uh, recipe for beer, which humanizes George Washington. He has this sort of dual personality of being a sort of militaristic person, but also a benevolent founding father, and so the beer recipe, I think, can be used to show his human side. This document has told different stories to different people at different times, and that's what makes it so alive and interesting is that there's different ways to read the document, there's different ways to see it.